welcome to all of you. I wish I could be there in person. I have uh, had the dorm room experience and uh, uh, with uh, IHS over the years, and I kind of miss it just a little bit, not not entirely, uh, not the actual dorm room. Uh, but I'm really pleased to be here today, and I do want to talk to you about um, one of my favorite uh, subjects, and that is uh, the work of the Ostroms, and specifically uh, the work their work on polycentricity and self-governance and uh, their contributions. And then I want to also bring in a few other sort of cases of how people might be uh, using this today, and especially some of the implications uh, that the this kind of work can have for uh, issues of liberty and freedom and self-governance, uh, because I think that's the key when you're thinking about uh, polycentricity. So today, I'm going to uh, just outline some of the Ostrom's contributions. I'm going to discuss polycentricity and self-governance in their tradition, and then I'm going to examine, as I said, some ways, so we'll get right to it. All right, so uh, Let's start with the Ostroms. Uh, this is the work of Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom. Uh, Eleanor was a student uh, in graduate school at, the, at uh, UCLA, got her degree there. Um, Vincent Ostrom was on the faculty at uh, UCLA at the time, um, and that is where they met. And the love story sort of began uh, for the Ostroms. Uh, but it's also, she was not sort of directly uh, a student of Vincent, although they did work together um, on a, a number of projects, but throughout their life uh, and throughout their marriage, uh, they worked together to um, develop a variety of institutional uh, analysis and uh, enhanced our understanding of this. And for that, of course, Lynn Ostrom wins uh, the Nobel Prize in 2009, shared with uh, Oliver Williamson, uh, both for their work on institutions, but I think from somewhat different uh, perspective that they took it on. Fundamental to the Ostrom's work is this concept that institutions matter. Um, they recognized that uh, if in fact you're going to make decisions, there are rules that are going to shape how you will reach those decisions socially. When we make decisions for ourselves, we may be able to change around the way in which we make those decisions constantly. But when we move to a social setting, then we have to establish some form of interactions uh, that are going to guide how we reach these decisions and how we stick to those decisions and how we implement them. And so uh, they recognized this. They recognized that it was a far more complex process than a lot of the work in political economy at the time was suggesting, where the focus was on voting processes and majority rule and sort of these high level aggregation kinds of things. And so with that in mind, they dug down into the institutional form. So that's where really I think their contribution comes from. Um, probably the work that is uh, most famous coming out of this school is Eleanor Ostrom's work on uh, governing the commons and common pool resource problems. And that work follows on the work that I'm gonna talk about today, the polycentricity work. And it really is an extension of it. And in Lynn Ostrom's Nobel Prize lecture, we hear her make the linkage between her early work and Vincent's work and others at the workshop in, in, at Indiana into the uh, work on the commons and then the work even beyond uh, into institutional analysis and design and then into um, her uh, social ecological uh, system. And so she developed a lifetime of this focus on institutions and self-governing. And that led her uh, to the various contributions that she made. Those are all on a foundation of Vincent Ostrom's work on constitutional design 
and institutional forms. And so he did a variety of theoretical work I wanna look at, and we'll talk a little bit about that. In this work then, it, uh, as I said, self-governing is really the key for them. And that is at the heart of what they wanna talk about. It's the intersection between theory and human possibilities. And why I think that's so critical is there is no particular institutional form that you can recommend that's going to work in, with regard to all kinds of uh, problems or all kinds of social decisions. You need to be sensitive to the nature of the problem we're trying to solve and the group that is trying to solve that problem if in fact you want uh, to develop theory that is predictive of what you might expect and some of the difficulties you might have in implementing policy in that uh, setting. So the theoretical foundations of Vincent Ostrom that start early get married to the empirical and theoretical uh, focus of Eleanor Ostrom and together that sort of forms the Bloomington School and um, the logic of um, uh, polycentricity and common pool resource, institutional analysis and social ecological systems. There are a lot of great books right now, a lot of wonderful work out there on the Ostroms and, and their work and how this has contributed. And I highly recommend uh, just a Google search will bring up a number of them. Uh, the first one there that you see is McGinnis work that's coming out of the workshop. He was a colleague um, for 40 years with them or uh, almost. And uh, as a result, he gathered a bunch of the work together. A lot of the work in that volume is uh, the work of Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom and others in the workshop that were working in this tradition. This particular volume is on polycentricity. So I put that up there. Additionally, they've gone in and the one on the uh, opposite side, in between we have uh, the Betke and Alajika uh, challenging uh, institutional analysis and development. Um, that's where it gets brought in to GMU and becomes part of this rich tradition of mainline economics that I'm sure you've heard about and that you'll be hearing more about uh, later today in uh, Becky's work also on Hayek and others. Um, so we see this tradition happening at the workshop in Indiana and we see it being picked up at GMU and that creates this foundational base. So I cannot come close to even scratching the surface of all that has gone on in this, but I highly recommend if you're interested in the topic, there's just a wealth of information and colleagues around the GMU um, and Bloomington arena uh, that you, we'd be happy to direct you to. And I wanted you to know that because we're gonna just touch my sort of interests and in a few bases here and leave a lot uh, left unsaid. So in terms of the Ostrom's model that I've been talking a little bit about already, they have, uh, it starts with this notion that Vincent had early on that when we had models that modeled the state, that they left so much out of the analysis that the state was not the governing structure that was most critical it was not unified and a singular decision maker. Instead, it was this complex, rich set of decision makers and decision uh, and individuals involved in reaching these um, outcomes that then became the United States says, or um, you know, France does this. Uh, that used to make Vincent's. Uh, uh, it was like fingernails on a blackboard. If you said the state around uh, Vincent or Lynn Ostrom and they would remind you that it wasn't the state. 
And in developing this theoretical foundation, they focused on the fact that we had di diversity across a variety of areas, language, cultural norms, our understanding, where we live, the geography, the weather, every single thing in our lives might impact the way in which we come together and see solutions for particular problems. And it was important for us to recognize that. And very early on, uh, Vincent working with Charles Thibault and others, uh, uh, Warren and others, worked on models in which you could think about the market for government in a way similar to general markets for other goods that individuals might vote with their feet and move around to those localities that offered up a set of services or a particular way of organizing government in that area that was most consistent with the values. And that's what they found in the US in federalism. Many of the states differ dramatically and many of the communities within states can differ dramatically. And individuals, if they have the right to move from one community to another, it's much more likely that they're going to be able to meet those preferential goods and uh, meet their own sort of package. And the higher or larger the geography on which we try and reach these decisions, the harder it's going to be to get the consensus over all of the myriad of things that that level of government might do. And so they, coming out of this theoretical form, it directed them to start thinking about if we keep a lot of decisions closer to the people, it will be easier to get consensus with less conflict and we should be able to govern more readily to solve the real public problems that we have. And so I, I think their, um, uh, their work on this is really uh, uh, rather critical. So. Uh, that forms the foundation, but that foundation isn't just a single level. That foundation is multi-level and you're always in those multiple levels. And again, in a system like federalism, especially, it's explicitly that you're in these multiple levels. You're in a local sort of level, you're in a uh, national level. So you have those types of geographic differences. But additionally, you have different levels of the kinds of decisions that you need to reach. So at the constitutional level, this is a level of analytic, uh, uh, an analytic level, where now we're going to set the form like federalism in place, that then will shape the way in which all of the other rules and all of the other decisions that we might reach are going to have to be consistent with. So that constitutional rule level is the level at which we duke out our fundamental differences across on how we should interact with one another. Individual rights, who can speak, how we're going to do representation, how often we're going to be able to interact in terms of changing rules, what are the rules for changing those rules, those kinds of things are going to be established at the constitutional level. The collective choice level is the level uh, in, in large part I've been talking about, and that is the level at which we're going to agree what we're actually going to do. Within the rules that are set, how are we gonna make decisions about policies? Are we going to uh, set up garbage service twice a week? Uh, or are we gonna set up garbage service once a week? Those are decisions that communities actually create. And they do so based on the willingness of the public to do these things together and to um, then agree to pay for what they cost together. And then the operational level is actually how those play out. How do the services actually get delivered? How do the programs get implemented? What are the rules and the regulatory forms uh, that are in place that are the rules in use uh, that Ostrom came up with? So 
coming out of those sorts of general logic of, of uh, self-governance and general logic of the role of uh, different institutional forms and different um, uh, levels of thinking about them, we get the several forms that Lynn Ostrom specifically makes big contributions to. Although, you know, Vincent Ostrom, their work is like this. In my mind, I can't understand Lynn's even later work when Vincent was not a direct piece of it without knowing the ideas and the concepts of Vincent Ostrom and how they feed through the kinds of assumptions and things that Lynn are making. And similarly, Vincent's work throughout his life, those many years they uh, uh, worked together was shaped largely by Lynn's clarifying and uh, sort of questioning and contestation uh, uh, with him about his ideas. And he was one that was pretty contestable sometimes. And so it was good to watch them uh, go back and forth. But this, I think there's like four major areas, as I said, polycentricity, governing the commons, institutional analysis and development, and social econo ecological systems. This is the one that comes sort of late in her, in her uh, life. And because her life was cut short um, too soon, um, she was not fully able, I think, to develop the social ecological systems work in the way she might have wished uh, to do so. Underlying all of it, several assumptions, humans are multifaceted, they're capable. As I say, they believed in self-governance. To understand what will work, it's essential that you look carefully from within communities. Again, because there are these diverse communities, you can't do a general model that doesn't take into account the ability of the community to make it look a little different in theirs and then make good predictions. You can do general theory. They believed in general theory, but then your general theory had to recognize when you applied it in specific settings, you were going to have nuances and differences in how it would fit and how it came together. And uh, I think that is sort of the huge contribution of the work is that we go back to these different levels. So let's talk the rest of the time, we're gonna talk about polycentricity uh, because we can't talk about all of it. A lot of you may have heard about the common pool resource work and a lot of things uh, that the Ostroms have done. And if you haven't, go to those many volumes. Most people have spent their time uh, looking at those issues. Um, fewer people have looked at polycentricity and some of the metropolitan and policy kinds of issues uh, that they looked at. And so I'm gonna focus on that today. So what is polycentricity? First of all, um, the logic of it is just what you would expect. There are multiple centers. And federalism sort of has multiple centers. It has the federal and it has the, the state level. And then within states, it has communities and these others. But polycentricity can be messier than that, of course. It can be many, many different um, uh, centers uh, that are making decisions that may interact with one another. And it may not be nice and linear or uh, hierarchical or um, off to the side in a nice neat way. It may be very confounded and confused. And one of the challenges of doing polycentric analysis is that because of the huge number of interactions and decision makers uh, that may be involved, it gets to be pretty confusing and complex to talk about. And so that is why the Ostroms believed it was so critical to go into the communities and do good empirical work around these ideas. So in these multi-centered arrangements, they actually have specific authority that they can 
operate with in terms of reaching decisions. And so that's key. It's not simply that, well, I delegate all this to you and you go ahead and do it. It's rather that we are at contention with one another in terms of taking on an issue like healthcare or an issue like um, you know, water rights or, or services. And it is in that contention or in that both of us having authority over this at some level that we have to work out and that the decisions actually emerge. And so that becomes really uh, critical for it. And early on, you see a federal system of administration would necessarily have recourse to overlapping jurisdictions where coordination would not be confined to command and control in a mega bureaucracy, but could be achieved by processes of cooperation, competition, conflict, and conflict resolution. And that becomes uh, a really important point. There are three factors, I think, that mean we should look at these um, policy issues from a polycentric perspective and not from a national policymaking perspective or the state policymaking perspective or um, even just the community level uh, policy perspective. We need to look at them. Um, from all sides. And the, one of the big reasons why polycentricity improves on actual policy design is we don't share the same preferences. Um, it's shocking to me, given recent elections and the level of debate in the country right now, that people still are shocked that a single national policy doesn't emerge exactly the same anywhere it's put in place around um, the nation or that people might not think it was a great policy if in fact uh, you pass it and, and put, try and put it in place in their state. Take vaccination rates. If you look at a map of the United States right now, you'll see quite a bit of variety, even though there's sort of a common problem and there's sort of a solutions and other things we know about it, there's science, we understand about it. And yet the way in which people come to the issue of whether or not vaccines should be mandated or who should have to get um, vaccines for certain activities in society or how we might monitor it, we don't have absolute consensus on it. And it's okay. And that's what the Ostroms were saying. It's okay that we don't. People don't have to live in Utah. They don't have to live in Florida. They can live in New York. They can live in California. That is the joy of voting with your feet is you can pick a jurisdiction that looks more like your set of values and your interests. And in doing so, again, conflict should be minimized because it's not constant in your life. It's if you are in California and you're a conservative or a libertarian in California, you may be pretty frustrated. But even in California, there are communities where those politics are more the flavor of the politics. And a lot of local things will be done in light of the fact that they don't share all of these views with what is going on at the state level and, and so on. There, it may be harder to get compliance in those. So that differences and preferences, the knowledge, knowing what people want is always a critical issue. And this was very much a part of their polycentric studies by the Ostroms. Pe the policymakers kept saying, let's do it this way. They said, no, wait a minute. That's not what people want. It's not improving the policy from their perspective when they went out to do their studies. And then finally, co-production of the good. If we're delivering goods to people, but what they do contributes to it, like you can deliver vaccines, but if people won't put them in their arms, it's not going to be a vaccination policy that works. But if you're in a small community and everyone there trusts one another and shares it, it may be easier for policymakers at that level to find messaging 
that makes it work in that community. So in Utah, for example, it's quite a conservative state where I'm right now. It's a, quite a conservative state. However, it's also a state where they share a lot of vision of community. And as a result, they're getting people more to do vaccines by linking it to the ideas of community and helping each other and your family and the extended community is your family, because those are messages that work in Utah in a way where they might mandate it in another state or don't tread on me becomes more of uh, the, the top level theme. And so polycentricity allows us to sort in this way. And I think that that's super important. Well, Lynn did, uh, took this sort of theoretical structure that the workshop and uh, designed coming out of this early work uh, from Vincent and did this huge empirical uh, studies of all kinds of different service delivery at the local level and how polycentricity created opportunities for the matching of preferences and um, uh, policy solutions and found that the more we consolidated, the more we moved to higher levels of policy making, it's, it's more similar that everybody's going to get that type of policy, but it may not be meeting the needs of people as well as those that are refined or structured or rearranged in some important way closer to the people. And coming out of that, that became um, a, a really important set of findings. It pushed back on this effort at the time. This is late 70s and into the early 80s, where we get a lot of UNIGOV, bigger is better, uh, let's consolidate. That's how we'll make better, more fair, more equitable decisions. Uh, that's the way to solve these problems. And what they showed was, it wasn't necessarily the way to solve it. And uh, in uh, Becky Lemke and uh, Paula Gashvili's uh, piece, they go back and look at some of the implications that emerge out of these police studies. And I think that they do a really nice job of sort of bringing it up to date and linking it into it, uh, into the sort of current uh, discussion and debate and, and making it very relevant again um, in their 2013 piece, they, they suggest that um, this empirical approach that the Ostroms used um, that is dirty empirical analysis, it's complex, it's not easy, you can't lay it out nice and neatly, uh, but you want to still generalize. And that's the thing, Lynn did not just do description of here's another tribe, here's another uh, community, here's another uh, service. Instead, what she did was look at this, uh, this tribe and their arrangements for water rights and this uh, community and their arrangements for irrigation and all that. She looked at lots of those dirty sorts of, um, uh, detailed uh, empirical analysis, but from that then came back to build frameworks that allowed us to understand what was going on here. And so that's the real contribution that I think her um, approach uh, and the workshop approach of this methodological linkage uh, between the empirics the theory and also they use the experimental lab uh, to test the theory that allowed them to refine and actually create more general statements. So at the end of the day, they are doing theory, but they are doing theory that is sensitive to the empirical differences uh, that exist um, across them. Um, again, multi-methods institutions. I want to now turn, having sort of laid out that, and you know, it's super, super brief, <laughs> ten thousand feet kind of uh, look across their work on polycentricity and why I think it is um, uh, really helpful. 
But I want to take it and sort of in the last little bit here, talk about how these polycentric communities um, and a polycentric approach allow us to think about um, freedom and think about diversity. And that's going to, uh, I'm going to just list a, a number of different examples here of how people have taken this approach to try and understand problems and how they're resolved and how they link. And it is the nature of the problem that finds that right level. So what polycentricity does is it says, we don't have to do everything at the community level, but we also don't have to do everything at the national level. And if we are sensitive to the things that should be done at the community level and those that should be done at higher levels of government, state level or national level or international level, then we'll be uh, much freer by having a variety of ways in which we tackle these problems that then individuals are free to the extent that they can enter and exit different jurisdictions to actually choose what is best for them. And so I think all of these examples that I'm gonna quickly, because I don't have any time, uh, run through, uh, really look at, and I hope you'll you know, continue to wanna look at some of these as well. Uh, and these, these two specifically, uh, Kukathas and Lofthouse, uh, Kukathas does the liberal archipelago. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, it's, it's a really interesting um, logic of how we maintain freedom and difference within different uh, and diverse communities and how we permit people to organize themselves in ways we may not like everything that they do. We may not enjoy the fact that we have strict liquor laws in Utah. We might like the, the, those kinds of policies in Nevada better but we don't like other kinds of economic policies in Nevada as well as we like in Utah. But by combining all of those things together and using voting with your feet, the ability to move between Utah and uh, Nevada permits us to actually choose the one and that uh, choosing these communities and then permitting uh, them to uh, recognize and allow them the authority over the decisions within their community becomes a really uh, useful way of trying to, trying to adapt us. Jordan Lofthouse takes a sort of polycentric approach and also looks at, but one of the interests, he's looking at Native American and reservations and the property rights issues and challenges for policy. And again, this is one where, which community are you in and how do those communities interact? And it's a very intriguing problem when you get these issues of entry and exit being challenged uh, in terms of who can be a part of what community. When we don't have all open borders, when we don't have complete freedom for people to exactly choose the community that they want to live in, the system of laws, the rules that they want to uh, live with, then it's going to be harder to satisfy them. And that is going to lead to a number of the contentions uh, that exist. And we see this when those groups come into contention with one another about who has authority and who has, um, who has right. It raises these broad questions then, whether or not exit and entry are sufficient to define freedom in these different communities. So one of the arguments for moving the UNIGOV or consolidation was that smaller communities would discriminate and not permit uh, people to um, be as free to um, uh, you know, live their lives, to be able to flourish in that way. And so, if you care about those kinds of things, which we all do, um, maybe you don't let people do whatever it is they want. But when does that come up against that sort of fundamental right or fundamental freedom? And can we have differences where people restrict certain freedoms for themselves voluntarily? 
and voluntarily agree in essence in their community to do things in a particular way. And that's one of these real tensions that exists in a lot of this uh, literature on um, entry and exit and how we uh, might think about it. Do you, polycentric systems allow you to access other levels of government without having to fully exit? And that makes polycentricity, I think, preferable to then just this complete archipelago. Uh, because I don't have to give up everything if I can say these issues are going to be resolved locally, but certain issues, fundamental human rights perhaps, have to be defined at a level where it captures and crosses over those different communities in a way. So are there issues that rise to those higher levels or larger communities that are more fundamental? Well, in the United States, that is the logic of our sort of federalist form is that some of these issues rise to constitutional level, to level of protection of human rights. Others, however, things on how often the garbage is gonna get picked up, how we organize our education, those things may be done more locally. And that is, I think, again, a benefit of polycentricity. It also permits another component and that is the voluntary component. And I think this gets left out because there's always this emphasis on government. When we talk about these kinds of governance, it's the case that sometimes we forget that especially if you're in smaller communities, people can do a lot of work without having to uh, sort of tap the authority of government to force and mandate action. Instead, we can develop programs that do this voluntarily. Um, and uh, Nathan Goodman and I have uh, looked at this issue in the LDS church um, and how they did service provision welfare system of their own within their church that in essence dealt with a lot of the issues that many people look solely to government to try to resolve um, in, in Utah in communities because of the nature of the LDS church and its geographic structure, it permitted more readily for them to solve some of the problems associated with dependency and um, excessive growth of welfare programs within the state of Utah by relying on these purely voluntary uh, systems uh, within the LDS church. And then that attitude developed within those voluntary arrangements that seeps over into the culture and into the sort of politics meant that people were much more likely to look for a voluntary way of you know, fixing up a park or um, providing short-term uh, food and other uh, assistance for someone who found themselves in need than going to the state or going to government in order to do it. And um, so we looked at a variety of those. And then fi the final one I wanna look at is uh, the store, store Hayfley and Grubb and store and Chamley and Wright. And there's just a variety of these work on disaster and disaster relief that also take this polycentric uh, lens and polycentric perspective into play and looks at the way in which different communities were able to come back after disaster. Um, and they look specifically at hurricane uh, disaster. Um, and in looking at these specific, you know, huge, all at once, huge consequence for entire communities, how does that underlying community and that structure that had been built, those institutional forms that had been developed over time, sort of voluntarily, how do those interact with some of the formal institutional ways of addressing these problems um, in those, in those uh, specific settings? So their work 
um, demonstrates that some of these tight knit, uh, you know, Jewish community uh, in, in New Orleans, uh, some of the, um, you know, Vietnamese community, other well-defined communities within this broader system of governance and these broader system of institutions, these communities were able to distinguish the way in which they solved the problem of coming back after hurricane and rebuilding uh, in ways that other like communities were not able to or were had much greater problem doing. And they, they show the degree to which sometimes the communities and finding the right level in terms of fitting themselves into that federal or state or regulatory structure uh, creates issues for the community or how they are able with some entrepreneurship and other um, um, efforts to try to address some of the blocks and some of the uh, frustrations uh, that can emerge uh, in these times of uh, post-disaster and community rebuilding. And so it's a really interesting um, example of that, um, where the private and the public come together in ways of uh, negotiating this and in ways that are more creative than just that simple institutional governance form that is laid out in the textbook. And so again, this comes out of those Ostromian, you got to go to the community, you got to see how they're actually creating rules for themselves how they are self-governing, that is the way we will understand it. So here are some major themes I wanna leave you with. First of all, creativity of forms for self-governing and institutional design are possible. They will emerge in response to social problems and to provision of public goods. Uh, that is a fundamental conclusion that we can draw coming out of the decades of work of the Ostroms. And it's being continued today by many people around our community uh, to, to demonstrate and to take those ideas even further. A second major theme is it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing that we have all this diversity. You often see the sort of policymakers, oh, how dare they be that way? How could they, you know, in this horrid hand wringing way that they do, it's like, why won't you be like me? Um, we certainly saw a lot of it the last uh, 15 months of our lives uh, with response, COVID response. That diversity is a feature and not a, a flaw of our system. And having different governing systems that allow us to recognize that diversity is going to allow us to live more vibrantly, we'll be innovative, we can see what others are doing, we can uh, learn from each other and from communities, and we can reduce the level of conflict uh, that we have in reaching policy decisions. And so we don't always get into this hideous fight that we've seen sort of in Congress on trying to resolve these things when there's so many different goals and objectives that we actually seek. And then finally, uh, that multiple methods are really needed if we're going to understand and move forward the research on these diverse institutional um, subjects. And so those are sort of the themes I'll leave you with.